Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats and silence your phones. The program is about to begin. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin shortly. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States and Mr. Douglas Imhoff. Ladies and gentlemen, the recipients of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Simone Biles. Sister Simone Campbell. Father Alex Carluzos. Lorene Powell Jobs, accepting on behalf of Steve Jobs. Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. Kazir Khan. Sandra Lindsay. Ambassador Cindy McCain, accepting on behalf of Senator John McCain. Richard Trumka Jr. accepting on behalf of Richard Trumka. Megan Rapino. Diane Nash. Dr. Julieta Garcia. Brigadier General Wilma Vaught. Fred Gray. Ambassador Raul Izaguirre. And Senator Alan Simpson.
Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good afternoon, and welcome to the White House. I know this is a, not a, it's kind of an old place for some of the guys that are coming here, but, but uh, thank you all very much, and to all the cabinet members, elected officials that are here, and and uh, and former elected officials like Joe Lieberman and a good friend is here. Uh, so many critical people and important people. I want to thank the Vice President, Vice President Harris, and the Second General for allowing us. Uh, to join them, no, to joining us, I, but it is always a pleasure when we get to hang out together. On Monday, we celebrated the independence of our nation, a nation always a, a work in progress, in creation of possibilities, the fulfillment of promises. That's the American story. It's not a simple one. It's never been a simple one, but the 4th of July week reminds us what brought us together long ago and still binds us finds us at our best. We strive for what we strive for. We, the people, doing what we can to ensure the idea of America, a cause of freedom, shines like the sun to light up the future of the world. That's the soul of our nation. That's who we are as Americans. And that's what we see, an extraordinary, extraordinary group of Americans up here on this stage that I have the honor to recognize today with the Presidential Medal of Freedom our nation's highest civilian award. <laughs> Simone Biles, the most decorated American gymnast in history, who well, everyone stops everything every time she was on camera, <laughs> just to watch, just to see her. And we see her compete. We see unmatched, unmatched power and determination, grace and daring. A trailblazer and a role model, when she stands on the podium, she sees, we see what she is. Absolute courage to turn personal pain into greater purpose, to stand up and speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. Today, she adds to her medal count of 32. I know you're going to find room. <laughs> 32. Olympic and World Championship medals. At age 25, the youngest person ever to receive the Medal of Freedom. The youngest ever. There's so much more to give. A fellow elite athlete, Megan, Megan Rapino. Where, Megan? Megan is one of the most accomplished soccer players and the first soccer player to receive the Medal of Freedom. Beyond the World Cup titles and Olympic medals, Megan is a champion for essential American truth that everyone, everyone is entitled to be treated with dignity and respect. Everyone. Along with her incredible teammates of the United States women's national team, and by the way, my son Hunter and daughter-in-law are here. His daughter is a great high school athlete, and she was enough, so excited to be with you when you when you won the national, when you won the, the the championship, and walking off the field. And I said, we said hi to you. She said, I was busy. <laughs> So when she wins again, I hope when I see her, she'll say, I think I know that guy. <laughs> Maybe. It, it depends. It depends. I think, yeah. Megan did something really consequential. She helped lead the change for perhaps the most important victory for anyone on her soccer team or any soccer team. Equal pay for women. Yeah. Equal pay for women. In 
Megan, like Simone, I hope there's room for this medal between all the other awards you and Sue have received during your reckless — your remarkable careers and your reckless play. I'm watching you. My Lord, you have such — you're — you are a good kid. <laughs> Simone and Megan would be the first to acknowledge they stand on the shoulders of those who came before them, like Air Force Colonel Brigadier General retired Wilma Vaughn. Gentlemen, Wilma is one of the most decorated women ever to serve in the United States military. She enlisted in the 1950s because she wanted to be a leader. She did that and more, becoming the first woman in almost every leadership role she held in nearly 30 years in uniform, shattering conventions, shaping a new tradition of our military. And she couldn't stop after retirement. She led to the creation of the Women's Military Service for American Memorial and the Gateway of Arlington National Cemetery, the first museum is kind so that we may know and be inspired by not just her story, but by the stories of millions of women who serve this nation in uniform. As a 23-year-old student at Fisk University, Diane Nash received a phone call from Attorney General Robert Kennedy's top deputies, warning her about the violence at the next stop of the Freedom Ride she organized across the South. She replied, and I quote, we all signed our last will and testament before they left. We know someone will be killed, but we cannot let violence overcome nonviolence. Look at that. Unmistakable courage and unshakable courage and leadership, Diane Nash shaped some of the most important civil rights efforts in American history. A key architect of the sit-in movement in Nashville, after four little girls were murdered at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, she called for a nonviolent movement across Alabama that planted the seeds that became the Selma campaign two years later. Her activism echoes the call of freedom around the world today. And yet, she is the first to say the medal is shared with hundreds of thousands of patriotic Americans who sacrificed so much for the cause of liberty and justice for all. And by the way, she asked me to make sure to add that because she didn't want to take all the credit herself. When Dr. King, Rosa Parks, and Claudette Colvin, and John Lewis, and other giants of our history needed a lawyer for their fight for freedom, you know who they call? They call a guy named Fred Gray. That's who they call. <laughs> One of the most important civil rights lawyers in our history, Fred's legal brilliance and strategy desegregated schools and secured the right to vote. He went on to be elected as one of the first African-Americans to Alabama state legislature since Reconstruction. An ordained minister, he imbued a righteous calling that touched the soul of our nation. And at 91 years young, he's still practicing law. He's still... And he's still keeping the faith in the best of America. And the best of America includes Raul, Raul, you're something else, man. <laughs> no, you really are. You really are. Uh, Raul was a son and a father who fled violence in Mexico and a mother who was a multi-generation Texan. Raul dreamed of American dream from San Juan, Texas, in the lower Rio Grande Valley. He served with honor in the United States Air Force then turned a small civil rights group into one of the nation's most important ones. For over 30 years, as president of the National Council for La Raza, Raul was an undaunted leader in the struggle for civil and human rights for Latino Americans. Challenging the powerful on behalf of the powerless, never forgetting where he came from and the promise of this nation. Born in Brownsville, Texas, Julie Garcia became a professor at a local community college. I know I'm biased since Jill is a community pro college professor, but community college professors are the best. That's the way <laughs> and I've learned teaching isn't what she or Jill does, it's who they are. It's who Juliet is. Over the course of her nearly 30-year career, she helped transform her community college into the University of Texas at Brownville, 
where she became the, his president and the first Hispanic woman to serve as the college president in American history. <laughs> Believe in education is the cornerstone of our democracy. She created a culture of excellence, affirmation, and intellectual curiosity for generations of students, many of the first in their families to go to college, and who see their American dream through her and because of her. Other than my family, the biggest impact in my life were the nuns at Holy Rosary and St. Helena's schools, the Sisters of St. Joseph in Claymont, Delaware. And you think I'm joking, I'm not. <laughs> nuns never forget a thing. <laughs> never. And by the way, I was doing Villanova's commencement, and one of my nuns from school was getting her doctorate degree. I presented it to her. And she said, that was pretty good, Joe, but you said you instead of me at the time. <laughs> they taught me in school, and they helped me. Uh, I used to stutter very badly. They gave me confidence. They gave me confidence that I could do anything. They really did. For so many people and for the nation, Sister Simone Campbell is a gift from God. And for the past, <laughs> for the past 50 years, She embodied the belief in our church that faith without works is dead and will know me for what you will know me for what I do. And what you do the least of thee, you do unto me. That's Sister Simone. That's what she does. The nuns in the bus were simply, simply remarkable. I wasn't supposed, I wasn't going to do this. They told me not to. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to tell a story. I went over to see Pope John, excuse me, Pope Benedict. Uh, in his last couple months, we didn't know at the time. And we had a long conversation. He's a great theologian, a very conservative theologian. And my avocation is theology. You come to my house, there's a whole wall on comparative theology. I know Alan's. But. And, uh, um, and so we finished the conversation. He's very generous. And he put his hand across the desk and put it on my hand. He said, can I ask you a favor? And then I was vice president, Mr. Vice President. I said, of course, Your Holiness. He said, I'd like some advice. you have any advice for me? I said, it'd be presumptuous for me to give you advice, Your Holiness. He said, no, really. And I smiled, and I said, well, one piece of advice. I said, I'd go easy on the nuns. They're more popular than you are. <laughs> the fact that six weeks later, he retired, I don't know what anyone is doing. <laughs> but, sister, your standing up was a big deal. Big, big deal. Becoming a lawyer to represent the poor and the left behind, a decade ago, as the nation was debating the Affordable Care Act and the values of our budgets, she, there she was, leading a group of nuns on a nationwide bus campaign to make the case, the moral case, that health care is a right in this country, not a privilege, and the obligation to help other people most in need. Compassionate and brave, Humble and strong, today, Sister Simone remains a beacon of light. She's the embodiment of a covenant of trust, hope, and progress of our nation. And I call her, I'm happy to call her my friend. Thank you, Sister. <laughs> Another dear friend of mine, and the reason why back in Delaware, in the Greek community, I'm known as Joe Bidenopoulos. You think I'm joking. Father knows I'm not. <laughs> Father asked me whether I'm still blessing my we Roman Catholics bless ourselves down here into the left shoulder. Greek Catholics go down into the right shoulder. I find myself being more Greek sometimes than others to get me in trouble. You want to know how I bless Father uh, Carlotis? Uh, you uh, more than 50 years your leadership in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America has mattered to every every prelate in the Greek Church. You've been an incredible leader, Father. A man of deep moral clarity and calling, he's advised generation of presidents and parishioners and unmatched, with unmatched humility and grace. I've traveled the country and the world with him, including Father Alex's homeland in Greece, to strengthen the bonds between two nations founded on the belief that democracy is the way. And on more than one occasion, Father Alex and I have had the honor to visit his All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch, Patriarch Bartholomew, which is a great honor. This is the 100th anniversary of the Greek Orthodox Church in America. We honor one of the most dedicated leaders, my dear friend, Father Alex.
Speaking of faith, when you meet Gabby Giffords, Congresswoman Giffords, you're reminded of the strength of faith. And the power of public service. Elected by the people of her hometown in Tucson, Arizona, because they trusted her. They trusted her. They still trust her. They believed in her. They learned, and they learned as a nation, what, they learned, and what the whole nation has learned, that she's the embodiment of the most of a, the most of a single significant American trait. Never, ever give up. My dad, Hunt's grandfather, used to have an expression. He said, never bend, never bow, never yield, never give up. Just get up, Joey. Just get up. Proof that we'll not grow numb to the epidemic of gun violence in this nation. Proof that we can channel the pain and sorrow we see too often in America into a movement that will prevail. With her husband, <laughs> United States Senator Mark Kelly, who, by the way, was that astronaut you all remember. <laughs> she is more consequential, I acknowledge. But, <laughs> but they're helping power that movement. On Monday, we'll celebrate the most significant gun safety law in 30 years because of them and because of the families like theirs all across America. Gabby is one of the most courageous people I have ever known. One of the most decent, stand-up, genuine guys I've ever served with, and I serve with a lot of senators, is this guy, Alan Simpson. Alan's the real deal. <laughs> Former United States Senator from his beloved Wyoming, a Republican, we served together in the United States Senate for nearly two decades. And one of the great things about Alan is he never takes himself too seriously, nor takes me seriously. <laughs> All kidding aside, this is the real deal. This is one of the finest men I've ever worked with. At his core, he's always believed in the common good and what's best for the nation. We didn't agree on everything, although we agreed on a whole heck of a lot. He allowed his uh, — uh, he, 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 he never allowed his, his — his, I don't know, his party or his state or anything to get in the way what he thought was right. He allowed his conscience to be his guide. And he believed in forging real relationships, even with people on the other side of the aisle, proving we can do anything when we work together as the United States of America. It matters, it matters, it matters. We need more of your spirit back in the United States Senate on both sides of the aisle. Um, just ask Kizer Khan who studied the U.S. Constitution as a law student in Pakistan. Inspired by its meaning, he emigrated to America with his wife and their young family when they were very little, but fully believing in the promise of this nation. They watched their middle son enlist in the United States Army with his own dreams to be a military lawyer, but ultimately sacrificed himself to serve his fellow soldiers. And we all watched as the oldest and darkest forces of hate emerged in new ways only to meet the strength, goodness, and decency of this Gold Star American family. Late in late November 2016, I invited the Khans to the Vice President's residence at Naval Observatory for a Diwali reception. An Irish Catholic Vice President of a Muslim Gold Star family had a reception observing a Hindu holiday. That, and I'm being very serious, that's the America that we know. That's the America he and I and most of you, I pray God, believe in. We, we were parents united by the pain of losing a piece of our souls and finding the purpose to live a life worthy of them. After today's uh, a Father's Medal of Freedom will rest next to the Son's Bronze Star and Purple Heart. And uh, Kizer uh, Khan, you will uh, continue to carry a copy of the Constitution. I didn't ask you, but I imagine it's still in your pocket as a reminder of the charge that has to be kept. When she was 18 years old, Sandra Lindsay emigrated to Queens, New York, from Jamaica to pursue her dream of becoming a nurse. As director of nursing and critical care at a hospital in Queens, 
During the height of the pandemic, she poured her heart into helping patients fight for their lives and to keep their fellow nurses safe. And when the time came, she was the first person in America to have fully vaccinated outside of clinical trials. Sandra, as I told you before, if there's any angels in heaven, they're all nurses, male and female. No, for real. They really are. Many of you who have spent a lot of time in the hospital, as some of us have, you know. Doctors let you live. Nurses, male and female, make you want to live. Make you want to live. Sandra's vaccination card and hospital scrubs and badge are part of the Smithsonian National Museum of American History exhibit on COVID-19. Today, she receives our nation's highest civilian honor. And <laughs> And the man who couldn't be here today but wants to be, wanted to be, Denzel Washington, one of our greatest actors in American history. Academy Awards, Golden Globes, Tony Awards, wide acclaim and admiration from audiences and peers around the world. He couldn't be with us today, but I'm, I'll be giving him this award at a later date when he's able to get here. I'll now turn to the three medalists who are being awarded the medals posthumously to the families. I know receiving this award on behalf of their loved one is bittersweet. It brings its honor, but it brings back everything, and it's hard. It brings you, uh, reminds you of the day that you lost them. But I know uh, anything uh, that I, and I appreciate your willingness to be here on this day. You've already seen more te technological change in the last 10 years than almost ever before in history. We're going to see a lot more change in the next 10 years. And much, much more of that is because of Steve Jobs. Not just because... <laughs> not just because of his innovations and inventions revolutionized personal computing and our way of life. It's for his embodiment of a core American character that he believed was in each of us. Character that tested, got tested in setback and failure. Character that's true in perseverance and daring. Character defined by what we leave on this earth when our time comes. And what Steve left us is something special. Technology with the capacity to improve our lives in ways that haven't even yet been thought of. And the love of his family, Lorraine Powell Jobs, and their children, who I had the great honor of working with when, the can when I was doing the cancer moonshot in the previous administration. They carry on this incredible legacy of doing big things, perhaps biggest of all, helping us end cancer as we know it. Because it matters. It matters. It matters to people who need help is why they do it, and it mattered to Steve Jobs. Richard Trumpka. He said about unions, quote, we do America's work. No one did more work for American workers than he did. For Rich, his work was synonymous with the word that defined his life, dignity, dignity. Dignity that comes with a good paying job that builds a good and decent middle class life. And his work was fierce, always trying to do the right thing for working people, fighting for and protecting their wages, their safety, their pensions they earned and deserved, fighting for the worker power and for America itself and our economic might and dynamism. In more than 30 years of friendship, he's always honest, fair, and tough and trustworthy, the guy you want in your corner. In fact, I was in Cleveland yesterday announcing one of the most significant actions to protect pensions for millions of workers and retirees in 50 years. Barbara Rich Jr. and the family, we felt him there. We felt him there with us, and we talked about him, and we feel him here today. Rich Trumpka was the American worker. Was the American worker. When I was a young man, too young to be serving the Senate, but early enough, old enough to get elected. You have to, you, have, you can't get, you can't be sworn in until you turn 30, but you can elect it before that. I got elected 17 days before that. And I had the great honor 
because of a guy named Mansfield, the majority leader from Montana, to put me on a very coveted committee at the time, the Foreign Relations Committee. That's when I first met John McCain a couple years later. He was a Navy liaison in the United States Senate, a liaison to our committee. When we traveled, we traveled with a Navy liaison personnel. We tr John and I traveled the world together, literally traveled the world together. We became friends. We agreed on a lot more than we disagreed on. And although he was my Navy liaison, I turned to him for advice lots of times when we were talking about foreign policy issues over abroad. But the two things we never talked about, we never talked about his imprisonment in the Hanoi Hilton, nor the death of my wife and my daughter. The pains were significantly different, but somehow we seemed to sort of understand one another. It was a long time ago. We both wanted to make things better for the country that we both loved, and that never wavered. In fact, I admit to my Democratic friends, I'm the guy that encouraged John to go home and run for office, for real, because I knew what incredible courage, intellect, and conscience he had. We used to argue like hell on the Senate floor. But then we go down and have lunch together afterwards, as you remember. We ran against each other, which I didn't like, on tickets to the highest office in the land. I was a candidate for vice president. He was the candidate for president. I never stopped admiring John, never said a negative thing about him in my life, because I knew his honor, his courage, and his commitment. That was John McCain. And the code he inherited from his family that served before him has passed on to his brothers, sisters, children, grandchildren today. Cindy, Madam Ambassador, and the family, I'm honored you have to accept this medal on his behalf. As they say in the Senate, a point of personal privilege. I was uh, staffing, John was staffing me on a trip to Asia in the late 70s. And uh, we stopped in, uh, where, there you are, we stopped in Hawaii. And, uh, Cindy, I think you were there on vacation. And, uh, and you were talking to my wife, Jill. And uh, John kept looking at her. <laughs> and, he, and he talked about her. So Jill and I did something which was a little presumptuous. We made sure they introduced one another. He still owes me. <laughs> I think it's the best thing we ever did for John. The very best. That's true. That's what he talked about when we left. And he didn't take long to call you, did he, when he got back? <laughs> My fellow Americans, please congratulate this year's Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient. Now I'm going to ask the military aide to read the rest of the citations as we present the medals. Please be seated. Simone Biles. Overcoming great odds, Simone Biles is the most decorated American gymnast in history. A former foster child who became a once-in-a-generation athlete, transforming her sport with artistry and degrees of difficulty that reimagine what is possible. With absolute courage and honesty, she expands the legacy of our greatest champions who challenge the powerful and speak up for justice and the wellness of body and mind. Leaning on faith in God and family, Simone Biles is an inspiring symbol of strength, grace, and pride in those three letters, USA.
Simone Campbell. Inspired by nuns in Catholic school, Sister Simone Campbell has dedicated her life to the suffering and the searching. For nearly 50 years as a nun and an attorney, she has led organizations that provide free legal services to the poor and advocate for workers and immigrants. Her moral courage helped pass the Affordable Care Act and guide the nuns on a bus tour across America to protect the impoverished. With humility and fearlessness, Sister Simone embodies the blessing of faith in God and our obligations to one another as fellow Americans. Julieta Villarreal Garcia. Born in a Texas border town, Dr. Julieta Garcia became the first in her family to graduate from college and the first Mexican-American woman to lead an American college or university. Over two decades, she transformed her hometown, University of Texas Brownsville, into a center of excellence for countless students who were inspired by her example. A trailblazer and a mentor, Dr. Garcia is considered one of our nation's top university administrators who understands the power of education as the great equalizer in America. Gabrielle Giffords. A daughter of Tucson, Arizona, Former U.S. Representative Gabrielle Giffords epitomizes public service. Voters elected her five times to state and federal office, even after that January day in 2011 that shocked our nation's conscience, she summoned the courage to keep serving. She learned to walk, speak, and write again. With the support of her husband, U.S. Senator Mark Kelly, she turned pain into purpose as one of the most powerful voices working to end gun violence in America. Because of her, lives will be saved and America will be safer. Fred David Gray. When Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus, Fred Gray represented her in front of the courtroom, just as he did for Martin Luther King Jr. in countless marchers for justice. Risking his own safety, he helped secure voting rights, desegregate schools, and win other battles for the soul of our nation. A patriarch of a family and a movement, Fred Gray is a lawyer by trade and a preacher at heart who follows the command to hate evil, love good, 
and establish justice in the gate. Lorene Powell Jobs accepting on behalf of Steve Jobs. <laughs> Few people in history embody the American spirit of innovation like Steve Jobs. The adopted son of high school educated parents, he redeemed soda bottles to pay for his meals after dropping out of college. At every turn of life, he dared to think different. As the co-founder of Apple, he created one of the most important companies in history, bringing computing into homes and phones and revolutionizing our way of life. A true visionary, a beloved husband and father, Steve Jobs embodied that most American of questions, what's next? Alexander Carlustus. <laughs> Protopester of the Economical Patriarchate, the former Vicar General of the Greek Orthodox Archdi Archdiocese of America, Father Alexander Carlustus is a humble servant of God and the embodiment of the ancient idea that binds two great nations, democracy. Through more than 50 years of service with moral clarity, love of family, and pride in the Greek-American community, the man known simply as Father Alex to presidents and parishioners alike inspires us to believe in the power of we the people. Kazir M. Khan. A son of farmers in Pakistan, Kazir Khan studied law inspired by the U.S. Constitution. He met and married a college classmate, Ghazala, and together they immigrated to America. A brilliant lawyer, he watched their three sons follow their American dreams, including their middle son, Army Captain, Mayan Khan, who enlisted during, the co during college and paid the ultimate sacrifice in Iraq. The father of a gold star Muslim family, Kazir Khan turned pain into purpose to become a foremost defender of the ideals of our Constitution and the embodiment of its highest ideals. Sandra Liza Lindsay. An immigrant from Jamaica, Sandra Lindsay is a nurse in Queens, New York, and the first American to be vaccinated against COVID-19 outside of clinical trials. At the height of the pandemic, she directed a team of nurses as they worked tirelessly to save patients while risking their own lives. When the COVID-19 vaccine became available, 
She was a ray of light in our nation's dark hour and continues to champion vaccinations and mental health for healthcare workers. She represents the best of America. Cindy McCain, accepting on behalf of John S. McCain III. John McCain was a giant among Americans from a family of patriots, a genuine hero who endured unspeakable torture as a prisoner in the war in Vietnam. A true public servant, elected twice to the U.S. House of Representatives and six times to the U.S. Senate by the people of Arizona, and nominated for the presidency by the Republican Party. Respected around the world, he was an eternal optimist who believed in consensus, character, and putting country first. His legacy continues to challenge us to cherish integrity and serve with courage and conviction. Diane J. Nash. A fearless leader of the Freedom Rides and Nashville sit-in movements, Diane Nash was a fierce light in darkness. She did more than dream a better America. She helped build one. As a founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 1960s, she led some of the most important 20th century civil rights campaigns that inspire activism around the world to this day. For her strategic savvy and absolute courage, America's, Americans owe a debt, of a debt of gratitude to Diane Nash for helping forge a path toward a more perfect union. Megan Rapino. <laughs> World Cup champion, Olympic gold medalist, named the world's best women's soccer player, Megan Rapino is one of America's great athletes. Known for her creative play and leadership, she also leads with a fierce will off the field. A champion protecting the rights of fellow LGBTQI plus Americans a leader on the U.S. women's soccer national team, perhaps the most dominant of any team in any sport in their successful fight for equal pay. Megan Rapinoe challenges and inspires millions of people who believe in themselves and the possibilities of our nation. Alan K. Simpson. <laughs> okay. 
An Army veteran and public servant, Alan Simpson served with conviction and integrity for 18 years as a Republican U.S. Senator from his beloved state of Wyoming. Despite increasing polarization, he brought people together with wit and wisdom to make progress and find common ground. Never afraid to stand up for what he felt was right, he worked on pressing issues like campaign finance reform and marriage equality. Alan Simpson exemplifies our national ideas of civil discourse, responsible governance, and public service. Richard Trumpka, Jr., accepting on behalf of Richard L. Trumpka. <laughs> the son of a coal miner, Richard Trumpka followed his father into the mines to later become the president of the United Mine Workers and president of the AFL-CIO. He never forgot where he came from and always fought for the dignity of working people. He built worker power by speaking truth to power, knowing that the middle class built America and unions built the middle class. No one did more in the last half century to build unions than Richard Trumpka did. A beloved husband, father, and grandfather, he was the American worker. Wilma L. Vaught. <laughs> Retired Air Force Brigadier General Wilma Vaught is one of the most decorated women in the history of the United States military. Enlisting in the 1950s, over the next 28 years, she would serve in Vietnam, Europe, and across America, continually rising in rank to become the first woman to hold every job she ever had. She was awarded the Legion of Merit, Bronze Star, and more. In retirement, she spearheaded the nation's first major national memorial honoring the nearly three million women who have served in uniform, further cementing her place in American history. Raul Izaguirre. Born to a Mexican-American family in the San Juan Valley, Raul Izaguirre saw a better world beyond a life segre in segregated South Texas. After serving in the Air Force, he became one of our nation's preeminent civil rights leaders as president of the National Council for La Raza. 
Over 30 years, he has forged immeasurable progress on voting rights, education, and more to deliver the promise of America to millions of Latino Americans. In service to our nation, he has helped ensure that America remains a land of possibilities. This is America. Folks, this concludes this event, but uh, we have a reception. I hope you'll stay and enjoy it. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats as the President, Vice President, Second Gentleman, and Medalist depart the East Room. Thank you.